Good evening. Welcome to the last Golden Lecture of the fall 2017 semester, What's Greater Than Great Britain? A Comparison of British Settler Services. We're going to hear tonight from Dr. Brian Strau, who is the BB&T Professor for the Study of Capitalism and Professor of Economics at Western Kentucky University, where he has taught since 1999. Dr. Strau has wide-ranging research interests that revolve around determining how to create and measure improved human well-being. With respect to this lecture, Dr. Strau has led multiple study abroad trips to Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa while he has vacationed in Canada and Zimbabwe. Brian met his wife, Dr. Claudia Strau, in graduate school at Vanderbilt University. Many of us know her better as the real Dr. Strau. Uh, together, they teach economics um, and raise their four children, 75% of whom are here tonight, so that's a good sign. Please welcome Dr. Brian Strauss. Uh, thanks, Joe. Um, I'm assuming they saved me for last, just in case I say something controversial or upset someone. And anytime you start talking about who's the greatest, I mean, Muhammad Ali's not here, but, but someone might think, well, of course, I'm the greatest or my country's the greatest. I'm reminded of a, a song I was taught in uh, elementary school. Uh, went to something to the effect of, oh Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. I can't wait to look in the mirror because I get better looking each day. To know me is to love me. I must be a heck of a man. Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble, but I'm doing the best that I can. See, that's what I was taught as this kid. Like This is, this is my attitude I'm supposed to have. So we're going to be talking about wh what is greater than Great Britain. Now, I'm only going to start there, knowing that there's different backgrounds in this crowd. Britain there is, in fact, in, in parentheses on purpose. That way, if you want to read it as, what's greater than great? Answer, Britain. Feel free to do that. Or maybe if you're from the other side of the pond, you say, I want to read this as, what's greater than Great Britain? Well, there might be a whole bunch of different options uh, to choose from. My point is, uh, what I'm doing and what the uh, economists have been doing more and more in the last few years have, uh, has been rediscovering political economy, kind of in the Adam Smith genre of political economy, asking the big questions of quality of life questions. What, what makes a country great? What policy outcomes would you like to see? And therefore, what policies would you need to enact to meet uh, those criteria? But see, as economists, we like to measure stuff. So well, we'll look at a little bit of data, but we want to see, hey, well, what, how would you determine if something's great? First of all, because then you need to know if you're getting greater or not. Or if you're not becoming greater, what can you do about it? Now, again, to try to keep offensiveness down as much as I can, if by chance we refer to anybody in your own mind uh, as being greater than Great Britain, I'm going to limit our discussion to only Great Britain's kids. right? Because if you tell me my kid is greater than me, I've got three of them out of four here, that's fine. I fully expect them all to be better than me. I'd be a little disappointed if they're not. So at a minimum, we can say who's the greatest parent of all. Of course, it's Great Britain. All right, so let's think about I want this kind of a thought experiment. We want to think about if we're going to call something great or country great or society great. Uh, uh, thinking of uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson, President Johnson, having the great society. Clearly, you have some idea of what you're thinking about in terms of uh, outcomes. And, and there are different metrics. And, and none of them has, has to be the metric. Right? You sitting in your chair you can figure out, well, this is what I want uh, to determine greatness by. This is going to be my definition of greatness. And then you can figure out, you know, on, on objective rankings, which country is the greatest uh, of all, however you determine it. Or you can cheat. You can wait to see where your country that you're rooting for lies and use those metrics to be, well, that's the metric that counts, because some of these will not all uh, line up together. All right, so we can think about greatness as big. I mean, if you think about the Great Britain's empire spanning every time zone, basically, in the world, the sun never sets in the British Empire. It was big, lots of land, lots of people under... Uh, the rule of a monarch. Uh, you can think of being powerful militarily or an economy that's powerful, a big economy. We can think about uh, income. I mean, I'm an economist. We spend a little bit of time thinking about income or wealth. So maybe the richest uh, economies in the world are the great economies. Maybe it's happiness. Maybe it's something like a quality of life. Yeah, you could have more money, but you'd like to enjoy uh, the time and, and resources that you have. Um, Maybe it's freedom. Uh, maybe it's a set of ideologies. Hey, we're land, a land of the home, or for home of the free, and land of the brave, or something of that effect. I don't know, freedom, bravery, I, random stuff. Stuff that makes you feel good about your country. Maybe that's what's important. Or maybe it's objective uh, uh, outcomes, like percent of uh, income inequality, or percent of your population in poverty, or literacy rates, or uh, ability to attain higher education. 
So there's a number of different metrics we, we could think about. We'll, we'll address some of these. There are plenty of more that we could think about. Because I know what you're going to think. You get to the end of this. I'm going to drop this down here. We're going to get to the end of this, and you're like, you didn't even address cricket. Like, the most important thing for greatness is how is your cricket team doing? Which should mean, if you know if you're following it, Australia did beat England in test, uh, today's test, uh, uh, cricket test. First to five, though, so maybe uh, uh, England will come back. Um, all right. Uh, what about the subtitled something about British settler societies? What do I mean by that? Uh, so who am I going to include in this study? Who am I not going to include? Well, uh, for reasons that I have up here, I'm not going to include the likes of India. Um, I'm not going to call that a, a British settler society. It certainly was un, uh, governed by uh, Great Britain for an extended period of time. But there's not a large number of English settlers, uh, British settlers that uh, get sent over uh, to India uh, on a permanent basis. Uh, so we're thinking it's got to be some country that's in a sense birthed by Great Britain. Large uh, number of immigrants leave the British Isles to go populate this land. They're going to uh, go by the British rule of law, uh, at least uh, for a while in some cases. Uh, and then there's got to be continued British influence. And so it's not just uh, some people left, they escaped, but there's a constant tie uh, with Great Britain going forward. So the six uh, that I will have some metrics for today uh, for comparison purposes, and notice uh, these are not all the current flags, but these are all flags that they've used at some point in time. So they've all incorporated uh, Great Britain into their flag as they are in fact the founding country uh, in each of these cases. So this is still Australia and New Zealand's flag. Um, this is an older Canadian flag. Southern Rhodesia is now Zimbabwe. They now have a new flag. Uh, Cape Colony was an um, uh, English colony down in South Africa, which is now South Africa. Natal was also a colony, but uh, this is just an example from um, uh, the Capes. And then this last one, uh, I don't know what, where I was living, but I, I didn't know that one existed until last summer. I took my children to Colonial Williamsburg uh, in Virginia. I did the historical sites. I won't name which battles and who we beat in those battles. It's not really relevant. The important part is that uh, I learned that this is actually uh, George Washington's flag. That's the flag that he flew uh, during the American uh, War of Independence. Uh, notice the one difference here, uh, right here. Uh, there's no uh, St. Patrick's Cross, and that's for a reason. Uh, the American Revolution predates uh, the formation with Ireland by a good 30 years. So uh, that's, he, he wasn't dissing Ireland uh, on purpose. All right, so I, I'm talking just to kind of define here my, my settler societies, trying to give you some idea of the number of British settlers that were there somewhat recently, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, but then uh, maybe historically as well. So you can see as of 1990, if we, we took a look in 1990 and measured uh, what percent, what number of their population was physically born within the uh, United Kingdom and then moved there. You see Australia was the number one uh, most popular place if you're going to leave here. And I can see it. I mean, I've enjoyed, enjoyed the climate here for the fall, but man, the beaches in Australia are pretty nice. There's a lot of sunlight. That's, that's not such a bad place to move to uh, either. Uh, U.S. just nosing out uh, Canada, but then South Africa and New Zealand finishing about uh, the same. I'm going to cheat here a little bit, use figures for Rhodesia uh, in 1959, or 1969. Um, uh, there's 52,000 of uh, English uh, birth. Now, uh, on the percentages over here, I'll just point out, uh, uh, take this with a little grain of salt. U.S. and Canadian numbers are a little harder because uh, they, they've messed with their census. Um, that is, the U.S. has now added a census category called American. So you get to be from America now, uh, if you want to be. And you don't have to file that with someone else. You don't have to hyphenate it. Uh, same thing in Canada. There's now a Canadian ethnicity uh, that they've recently put in. So uh, you don't know for sure uh, where these people are from. So take that with a grain of salt. But the vast majority in both cases are from uh, the British Isles. Uh, the reason, I, I, one of the reasons, because you can, you can complain that I've even thrown in South Africa and uh, Rhodesia slash Zimbabwe in here. Uh, I would argue in part I need to keep the U.S. out of last place in some cases, so I need to add some other countries, you know, for uh, keep up appearances. But partly here, too, I just want to point out that Rhodesia, of the, in 1969, 7% uh, uh, of its population uh, is, in fact, uh, uh, of European descent, and three quarters of which are British. It's one of your more British-y places uh, uh, in the empire, certainly more so than the United States. Uh, German Americans are the number one, or largest ethnicity. You got Hispanic Americans and African Americans uh, coming up in, in, in the Irish. Uh, so you've got uh, English are going to be uh, certainly much further down. 
So we don't, have, we don't need some ethnic purity here to be talking about Great Britain or uh, its offshoots by any stretch of the imagination. Bigness, well, all right, well, who's big? We've got population up here. If you're going by big is better, uh, then it's clearly the United States, it's, it's more populous. Uh, it's got over 300 million people. Uh, UK and South Africa are fairly uh, comparative. And then you gotta say, oh, poor little New Zealand's only got four and a half million people uh, running around from uh, earthquakes down there. It's not how, it's a nice place though. I don't know that I wanted to find greatness just based on size. That being said, after World War II, Australia and New Zealand were both very concerned about their size uh, for national defense purposes. Uh, they were afraid during World War II that Japan was going to invade, and so they both adopted a phrase after the war called uh, populate or perish. So they made a very uh, concentrated effort to increase the, their population. So maybe, maybe too small is not so great, uh, nothing necessarily great about too uh, big other than uh, maybe uh, it would help in uh, national defense. Uh, all right, so the last one there is just, of the places the United Kingdom currently has is, has foreign investment, invests money, machines, tools, and factories. U.S. is their number one whore, source, uh, home for, or number two, no, number one home for foreign investment. Canada is the eighth, so apparently you guys like sending money to North America. Uh, this is going to update because most of the other countries in the top ten are, are European countries. Uh, that may change here coming up. Uh, but I will assure you that through all these countries past, there's no single bigger uh, economic uh, funder than the United Kingdom. They lead uh, investment versus every other country in all of our sample countries. So they've had sustained impact. All right, what's most important then? Is it power? Well, it's like a power uh, metrics. That's uh, Team America World Police uh, reference there. All right, um, so we've got two things. I put these up there on purpose. We've got size of the economy and size of military power uh, by, based on a military power index. And okay, the US, if, if big is your thing, uh, they seem to be the most powerful uh, in the world, both in terms of uh, size of the economy. It's not quite close. Uh, UK in our list here is coming in second, but it's 18 and a half trillion to, to two and a half. So it's a, it's a little bit different. Um, the other big thing I want to point out here is just the difference that maybe some of our sample countries has taken with, their size, uh, with respect to the size of the military. You see, we've got some very uh, big economies uh, in the world represented here. Um, Australia, uh, Canada, US, uh, US and UK, it's four in the top, uh, four in the top, 13 countries in the world. So we've got four of the biggest economies in the world. Uh, but when you look to Australia, when you look to Canada, look down to New Zealand, the size of their military is not nearly uh, what it would be based on their income, if they were going to be uh, uh, putting money into their military according to anyone else in the world. So you see uh, Zimbabwe, South Africa, they're actually, you might argue, over-investing in military. They're spending more on military. And I guess if you're a dictator in Zimbabwe, it makes sense. You've got to keep guns around to, so you can keep your stuff. You see Robert Mugabe got paid 10 million bucks uh, to vacate office with a lifetime pension. Gets to keep all the money he stole with immunity. It's a nice gig if you can get it. All right, uh, so, so already we've got some distinction in societies. So, so of the British children, as it were, some have said, you know what, uh, military power, US seems to be down that route. But the other ones, the Canada, Australia, New Zealand, they're a little more interested in making money, not as interested necessarily in their military uh, accomplishments. UK is about where you'd expect, given their, the size of their economy. What about the money? Let's follow the money. Uh, I've got them ranked here by per capita wealth. So we think about income and wealth are two different things. Uh, income is what you made this year. Wealth is what you own minus what you owe. So there's gonna be some historic legacy to maybe you had income for a longer period of time uh, than other countries. Uh, maybe more what we're picking up here is uh, ability to save or willingness to save uh, over time. If you've earned income in the past, did you blow through it or did you uh, bank it? So uh, on our list here, if you're going to define greatness by wealthiest, uh, and this is going to be on a per capita basis, you need to have to tip your cap to uh, Australia. But now if we're thinking worldwide, you still have four, well heck, five of the top 11 wealthiest countries in the world are Great Britain and, in a sense, four of its uh, children, four of its societies that it set up, uh, it initially uh, populated. That's a pretty good record. So if you're thinking greatness already, you're thinking Great Britain is pretty great and it's got some, uh, uh, done a great job setting up other societies. Certainly no other colonial power in world history can say uh, that same thing. 
Uh, income's a little bit different. Uh, income, we're a little, as a group, a little bit further down uh, the rank. Uh, U.S. is going to lead the, lead the uh, uh, show here. But then there's income inequality. This is rank and income inequality. And the way to read this rank is uh, Zimbabwe, or South Africa has the second most income inequality um, in the world. So in this case, a low ranking for income inequality would mean lots of inequality. The high number, notice the UK here has the high number here. United Kingdom has the least amount of income inequality. So there. If greatness is defined by achieving a high standard of living and sharing it uh, most equally, then of our societies in question, Great Britain has uh, achieved that result. So again, you've already got some different metrics. You've got power, you've got some income, wealth. I mean, this is just the money side. You've got different variables you could choose from uh, on greatness. What about happiness? A little thing about happiness. I don't, know, I don't know what you know about happiness. I find happiness research fascinating. Um, one of the keys to happiness, or seems to be the key to being happy, is setting expectations as low as possible. Right? It, it's, happiness revolves around exceeding your expectations in life. So if you set low expectations, you're happy. So uh, Denmark always is at the top or near the top in, uh, in happiness rankings. And so I suppose this must be how the average uh, Dane operates. They wake up in the morning, they yawn, they stretch, they look around, they're like, I'm not dead yet? Oh, that's awesome! And they have a great day, because they didn't expect to make it through the night. So just assume you die tonight, and when you wake up tomorrow, you're going to be extremely happy. All right, uh, on, so on international surveys, who is a happiness? Well, here we come out pretty well uh, uh, again. Uh, at least we get five of the top 20 happiest countries in the world. Uh, maybe we're wealthier than we are happy. I, I'll give you that. Uh, we do a little bit of job, better job of accumulating wealth than obtaining happiness. We've got a, a cluster there. The Canadians, the Kiwis, and the Aussies are seven, eight, nine. That's a pretty good run. Um, maybe we think about uh, other quality of life measures, like this, this freedom thing. This is just economic freedom. Uh, this is an economic freedom ranking from the Heritage Foundation. Um, a lot of times, at least American students will think, well, we, we American economy, U.S. economy is some definition of what a free market economy looks like, but it turns out if, if you're using this metric, uh, we're not top 10. In fact, uh, New Zealand, Australia, the Canadians, United Kingdom all have freer economies, uh, allowing people to make choices with respect to the jobs they have and, and uh, what they buy and, and, and how they buy it uh, to go about their economic business. So we're a little bit further down. I mean, we're no Zimbabwe. I mean, Z Zimbabwe. Uh, again, we're going to put this in here to make ourselves feel, I don't know if it makes us feel better or worse. I mean, part of me, I guess it's like, hey, we're, at least we're not them. But on the other hand, this was a, it was a former British colony. It was an attempt. Cecil Rhodes tried to extend the British Empire, move a sizable number of uh, uh, Brits down there. Um, they're no longer there. I mean, the, it's, we had, what, 50? At its peak, uh, there were 200, look, between, two and a, between a quarter million and 300,000. Um, uh, Europeans in Zimbabwe, and now I don't think I don't think there's 500 uh, left. So it's uh, 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 in a sense one of the, the children that went awry. South, uh, yeah, South Africa is definitely the key there on life expectancy. Is going to have the lowest life expectancy, well, lower uh, in Zimbabwe. These are two of the countries in the world that are fa facing the uh, HIV ep epidemic the most. They have two of the highest uh, infection rates, and that's definitely doing a number on their uh, life expectancy. And Australians, um, they're living a long time. And they get to go to the beach. They're not even getting skin cancer, I guess, from going to the beach. They have a very laid back lifestyle. If you've never been, they like making money as long as it doesn't get away of sport or the beach or downtime. I mean, they're, they're, it's definitely a laid, it's like going to California and wearing your sandals to work all the time, but as a whole country, that, that's as near as I can uh, make it. What about uh, inclusiveness? Uh, maybe we can define a, a great society by, uh, do you have open arms and open doors and, and, and uh, do you love on people? Well, there are different metrics that we could use for this. Uh, this just happens to be one uh, current percentage of your population that's uh, from abroad. You notice there are going to be a couple different clusters here. U.S. and U.K. are very similar uh, in this. 13.1% in the U.S of the current U.S. population was born abroad, 12% uh, of the United Kingdom. We're in a pretty similar boat currently. Very much different though from Australia to 27, New Zealand at 22, Canadians up at 20. 
Again, the first two countries, I said, specifically changed their attitude toward immigration uh, slowly after World War II, but specifically after uh, Great Britain joined the, the Commonwealth, starting in 1973. Uh, if you know much about New Zealand and Australia's Im immigration history, they used to have what amounted to about a white-only immigration policy, which they ditched, and their economy turned around dramatically for a number of reasons that included uh, afterwards. They're very welcoming uh, to uh, outsiders. Now, comma, uh, I will say that in each of those cases, um, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, they have very specific immigration um, metrics. That is, they have a point-based system. Uh, these are not three countries that have large amount of illegal immigration. It's kind of hard to swim to Australia. I don't know if you know where it is, but it's in the, the land down under. New Zealand's land down under the land down under. Like, it's even harder to get to. It's where you jump off to Antarctica. They've got the Antarctic Station down there in Christchurch, uh, New Zealand. It's, you, you gotta fly in, basically. I mean, you could take some boats uh, from Indonesia. You can try to sneak into the Northern Australia, but that's where all the U, uh, Australian Navy sits and they're just waiting for you. And then they take you to some islands. So they, don't get me wrong, they're not opening their doors necessarily to everyone in the world. To skilled immigrants, though, of all uh, countries, they're, they're really uh, open. In fact, this is from 2016. Of the skilled immigrants in the world, right, who, who, who change countries, they go anywhere in the world, presumably, these are high educated, highly educated, highly skilled people. What were the four countries in the world they chose to go to more than any other country in, in raw numbers? It's our little club here. Uh, U.S. Uh, came in first in raw numbers. U.K. came in second. Uh, and then uh, Canada third and uh, Australia fourth. New Zealand, by percentage, is certainly well up there. Uh, they're just a much smaller uh, economy. So if you're skilled, if you know how to make money, where you seem to want to live is in, uh, at least in some of these countries, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, U.S., uh, UK Kingdom, United Kingdom are definitely high on your list. And there's different ways we could think about that. We could say, well, that's great. They're going to stimulate our economy and, and add to diversity in our economy, which I think is the correct way to look, about, uh, look at this and to see that as an asset. Not everyone uh, sees it that way. Some say, well, uh, someone's stealing my job. or I, There are other ways. That, so you can define greatness how you want. I, I might like the fact that we're welcoming, particularly to people who are going to, I don't know, pay taxes, show up for work, start businesses, employ people. Um, one of the things, uh, I'm, I'm an economic historian by trade, and one of the things that always struck me as interesting is any, every time you look at the U.S. Census from as long as we've been collecting data, and you look at number of hours worked by people who are born in America and people who live there but moved there, uh, so immigrants, the same thing is true in 1880 as it is, was in 1940 as it's true in 2010. Every time we measure this, people who moved there work more hours per year than people who were born there. It's not to say that Americans are slackers per se, they, they work a lot of hours, but it, it seems to be that we're, we disproportionately draw in these countries people who want to show up for work and who benefit uh, our economy for having them and, uh, and it, there's a reason to be welcoming. Uh, it's just economically, even being economically selfish, there's a reason uh, to welcome uh, other people into our uh, economy. All right, well, that leads me to think, all right, if, if all the, the skilled workers in the world, if where they'd really like, I mean, they, can, they might want to stay in their own country. I mean, there's cultural reasons and family reasons you want to stay there. But if you want to go somewhere, where do they lie at night dreaming about? Well, the cool countries, where the cool kids are. So maybe we want to define uh, greatness by, are you cool? So keep cool and carry on. I love the fact that I could find Snoopy to help me out on this one. Well, that's where we want to be. Well, I don't know. There were some different metrics here. There's no... Obviously, there's some revelation on where people want to move, those who could choose to go anywhere in the world, where, where do they want to go. Um, on this uh, discussion of, of, of coming up with who is the greatest of all, uh, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, uh, the Rich Kids Club uh, around the world, uh, they've got this How's Life Index that they update uh, every year. And one of the great things about this index, they, I put the variables on the right-hand side, they measure a number of different things. There are different metrics. Uh, you can yourself decide how to weight each metric. You can decide, well, what really matters are jobs and income. I don't care about the environment. I mean, you could do that on the, their metric. There's a little toggle. You move it back and forth, and you can rank each of these different variables, how important you think they are relative to the other ones, and it will change the relative rankings of different countries. So in 2016, if you kept all these variables equally ranked, 
Then it turns out Australia, second in the world, second best country in the world, according to this set of metrics collectively. Uh, Canada coming in five, New Zealand seven, uh, UK or US uh, at nine, so four in the top 10, UK at 16. Now there's only 38 countries in the OECD, so South Africa does take last place. On the bright side, they are in the OECD, and that's the only African country uh, that can say that. So it depends how, how you're looking here. But see, this might take other things into account uh, to measure greatness. Uh, and the best thing about the tool is you can decide which of those are most important. All right, let's go to a British publication. Let's see who the British say. If you're looking at cities, so forget countries for a second. If you want to live in a wonderful city with uh, low crime rates and high education rates and high incomes and ability to get a job, where are the, where are the cool cities uh, in the world? Where are the most livable cities, according to The Economist magazine? And it turns out in, our top, uh, in their top 11, four in Australia, three are in Canada, one's uh, in New Zealand. Um, that's out of 11, what is it, eight out of 11? Um, all right, what you can definitely say are the British settler societies know how to make some nice cities. Uh, of those eight, I've been to seven of eight, and I can, I, I, Perth is just, come on, move it a little bit closer. It's the city that's most, the most isolated population center in the world. It's the furthest to any other city. Uh, it's out there, so someday I'd like to get there. Apparently, it's, it's pretty nice. Um, That's, that's, that's saying something, to be able to come up with uh, almost, almost run the list. Now it's a British publication, so you might say there's some bias. Some people have criticized The Economist for being uh, English-centric in their decision of what makes a great city to live in, but they're using objective criteria like incomes and crime rates, and it just turns out that these are, I mean, Detroit's not cracking the list. I, I, don't, I don't know which, which one, New York, Chicago, LA, where, San Francisco, whatever one you want to put up here for the US, we're not, we're not cracking uh, the top 10. All right, a couple last metrics you might want to think about. Um, we can think about, if we're thinking about greatness, I mean, I'm a college professor. Of course the metric that counts is the percentage of your young population that's got a college degree. I mean, that's uh, going to help your economy going forward. It's going to help your standard of living going forward. People with college degrees make better citizens uh, on average. And it's the Canadians who are, are leading the pack here. So if your definition of greatness is highly educated, uh, the Canadians uh, do it. Now, it, it doesn't hurt that Again, part of their immigration policy is, oh, you've got a college degree, uh, knock yourself out, come on in. Um, U.S., I wish we had that policy. I send all kinds of foreign students who are studying at Western Kentucky University. They graduate, they want to stick around, and we send them back. It's one of the dumbest things I've ever seen. We, we pay to educate the kids, they want to stay, they'd be a great member of the economy, and we're kicking them out? Um, that is self-defeating economic policy. UK comes in in second. So we can see a cluster here. Canada is by far and ahead uh, the most educated. Uh, then we've got a cluster with UK, Australia, and uh, United States. Uh, the, one of the reason South Africa's got a parenthesis there is I, I broke out uh, white and black uh, population. Uh, so the, the, the one on the right is just the white population. So white South Africa is about as educated as New Zealand. They're a little more agrarian, not quite as educated as uh, the others here in the club. Um, but there's definitely a, a, a racial education divide for obvious historical reasons uh, in South Africa. It's one of the things they have to uh, overcome going forward. But notice there's a big correlation here between education level and incarceration rate. It's not perfect, but if we were to plot that out, uh, it's not unimportant either. Um, who doesn't like locking people up? Well, um, the Canadians uh, lock the fewest uh, number of people up uh, on our sample group here. Zimbabwe doesn't, uh, I guess they just run away uh, to South Africa as a quarter of their population has fled. So you take them out, we've got Canada locking a few up. Um, UK looks really well on this list. Not, maybe that goes back to less income inequality leading to uh, less crime. US, US is definitely an outlier. Um, if you're defining greatness as your ability to lock people up, and, 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 and yeah, we're awesome. Uh, we, we have more incarcerated people than anywhere else uh, in the world. Uh, second highest incarceration rate. So uh, maybe we have some work uh, to do there. Maybe if we improved our education system, for instance, maybe that would help. Um, maybe if there was less income inequality, maybe that would help. There, there's some uh, policy things we might want to pursue there. Change some drug laws, uh, whatever the case may be. All right, so those are some metrics. We could, again, we could do some other ones. Uh, uh, Best rugby team, that's probably New Zealand. I mean, there, there are, again, they're best is, greatness is in the eye of the beholder. So I'm gonna just finish with just thinking a little bit about uh, 
kind of like my buddy Adam Smith, the, the, the Brit himself, who sat and thought about the Scotsman who sits and thinks, I wonder what makes a country great. I wonder, I wonder why some countries are greater than others. How do they, is that by accident uh, that that stuff happens? I mean, I'm not going to lie, I, I haven't sat and read that whole book. Oh my gosh, it can be a little dense from time to time. But boy, are there some excerpts worth reading. Like the Cliff Notes version is amazing, right? Uh, the Reader's Digest version. So maybe don't, maybe don't uh, thumb through the whole thing. So, but he's been asking the same question. We're continuing as economists to ask this question. Uh, what makes a society great? But we're going to, hopefully, part of the, where economists are going to maybe differ from some other social sciences, we're going we're to demand we measure this stuff. We're going to demand that we look back at the data. You can't just rely on back and say, well, it's where I'm born. By definition, it's the greatest. Well, by what metric are we going to do that? And by what metric, if you're saying that one political party gets in charge over another political party, I don't know, I'm the economist. I don't want to, I don't want to, I've got a favorite baseball team. It's, it's Chicago White Sox, if you didn't hear. Like, I'm going to root for them, whether they have good players, bad players, whether they're crooks or whoever. That's, that's where my heart is. That's not how I want to run public policy. I don't want to run public policy based on some random affinity for a partisan team. I want to look at metrics and figure out what is a, a good society, what is a great society, how can we improve that society, and what policies do we need to promote uh, to make that happen. Well, we could be here all day. Let's hit a couple of the big ones then. Well, what does Adam Smith have to say to us? Well, uh, and what is the... Uh, I've taught a course this semester on the comparative economic histories of New Zealand, Australia, Canada, uh, US, South Africa, Zimbabwe. So my course this semester was kind of unlocking this. What policies have these countries uh, done in the past that were self-defeating, like the white immigration only policy or big tariff barriers that pretty much they all slapped in on themselves as soon as they became free? Uh, they, none of these countries ran the gamut of having sound economic policies through their whole uh, history. Right? You, you can't rejoice with the repeal of the Corn Laws unless you had the Corn Laws uh, in the United Kingdom. So you're going to have uh, times when uh, your economy isn't going to be growing as well for any of these countries. But what can we gather from uh, their economic history that is important and that is true across each one of these? And that is when these economies are open to trade, immigration, and investment between countries, they grow. It's not just true for these countries, it's true for all countries around the globe. Uh, if you look at the, the period of time, the 30 years before World War I, the world was becoming increasingly integrated and incomes were going up. Uh, people were engaging in trade, uh, uh, Im immigrants were going everywhere, investment was happening on a cross-country uh, basis. It was unfortunate that the uh, First World War uh, derailed that because it, it set the world back. Uh, between World War I and World War II, we would not find very open system toward immigration, toward trade, toward international investment. And as you might imagine, you had this thing called the Great Depression uh, during that time frame. It's not depressing on accident, it's depressing on purpose, because you should know better uh, by this point in world history. So what, what does Adam Smith say? He was all about specialization in trade. It's not just trading, you gotta be good at something, find what you're good at, get better at it. Specifically, that's the role that uh, we as educators should help facilitate. Not just thinking about what we want to think about, but what can we do to help the next generation to obtain the skills they need to achieve the outcome that they want for their own personal lives to be great. Because it's one thing to talk about greatness of a country. We at the individual level have to think about what would it mean for me in my own life to be great and what do I need to do in order to make that happen. It's not going to be just, oh, I'm in the right country or it's good. Greatness shall fall upon me. Maybe, if you're Winston Churchill. But it, the rest of us, it's not a matter of just being in the right time in the right place. You're going to have to put some thought into this and, and adopt policies for your own life that will help you reach that greatness. Man, that last one's so boring. Oh, work? Wow, man, I kind of want to hang on the beach. Save spending. It's Christmas time. It's so much more fun. Build more robots. I thought people hated robots and they were taking their job. This, uh, not always politically popular, not always easy, right? I'm not... I don't know, some people even label this, this last one, they call this thing austerity. Like, you're not having any fun. You just want to show up for work and save money and, and reinvest it for later? There's something inherently wrong about that. The 1960s would not have been a fan of uh, this last one at all. Um, but if we look at uh, how economies have gotten wealthier over time, uh, that's it. Lastly, if we're going to make uh, Great, Brit Great Britain great again, or America, or anyone great again, uh, how, uh, how might we think about this? What's the role of Brexit in making Great Britain uh, greater than? And we'll see is, is the answer. And it depends how we, how we take this. 
as Great Britain wants to take this. Um, if we look at the uh, European uh, uh, Union, if we look at it just based on population, uh, without uh, the United Kingdom, the EU is at 445 million people. Let's think about different ways the UK could orient itself, if it chose not to orient itself toward Europe. The countries that we're talking about today uh, of just uh, Canada, US, Australia, New Zealand, if you join those four with the United Kingdom, they've got a population together at uh, 455 million. That's just as big as Europe. I mean, there are all other alternatives uh, than Europe. Europe's not the only place uh, in the world. But I think in those, the, the, the five eyes is an official, uh, it's a military intelligence uh, word. Uh, these are five countries that share military intelligence uh, uh, together. So we're already in uh, inclusive agreement, just the five of us together. That being said, even that's really too limited. I think uh, UK would make a mistake if it just said, oh, let's get back together with our, uh, the kids that uh, bring them back home, that uh, uh, make the US Great Britain again, and, 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 and all that. That's, that's still selling themselves uh, a little too short. Right? There are over seven billion people in the world. If Great Britain is gonna succeed, at the, economically speaking, be great again, uh, they need to think big. Uh, I would hope that Theresa May is thinking about uh, free trade agreements with everyone in the world, uh, regardless of what location they're in. I mean, this is what Australia learned. Australia used to be completely dependent upon the UK for their trade. UK joined the European Union, they thought, oh my gosh, what are we gonna do now? What did they do now? Well, they traded with Japan. Dramatically increased trade with Japan. And then China came along. Australia's got a trade surplus with China. That's the envy of the United States. You, you adapt. You diversify, you adapt, you don't close yourself off to the rest of the world. If Brexit turns out to be a, a motion to turn yourself off to the rest of the world, put up big trade barriers, prevent immigration, prevent the flow uh, of ideas, uh, we will see uh, a very sad picture uh, going forward. Um, there are no shortcuts to this. Uh, it's gonna be a, a difficult process. There's potentially light at the end of the tunnel. Switzerland, if we wanna look at the map, you look at the OECD index, they're in Europe, not part of the European Union, do very well, very much fans of trade, investment, work, savings. Norway, the same thing, not in the club, doing very well uh, on all the metrics. In fact, if you, part of the reason I restricted this to the countries I did is, uh, you kind of look bad sometimes comparing yourself to the Scandinavian countries, uh, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, um, which, my son will appreciate, will lead me to quote the musical group Outcast. What's cooler than being cool? Because I said we were the cool countries. You guys, some of the students tell me, what's cooler than being cool? Ice cold. Ice cold. So Scandinavia is ice cold. That's the only place that could possibly be cooler than the countries. Yeah, no, I, I, got, a, I got a kid back there. I got a humor with that one. All right, so going forward, we'll see. But if we take the global picture, if we learned anything from history and studying the countries uh, that we looked at today, being open to immigration, trade, investment uh, are going to be the keys. Any great questions? <laughs> okay, any good questions? Bad questions? Sub, sub average? Zimbabwe questions? Uh, I believe it's Norway. Uh, who is number one in the OECD ranking? Norway. It's tough to beat. When you've got that much oil and gas in the North Sea that you can pump out, and do bother to pump it out. I mean, don't get me wrong. You've got you to be one to pump it. You can't pull an Anwar in Alaska. But if you pumped it out and banked it, one of the great things about uh, Norway is they're, fisc they're fiscally responsible. So Norway, they, they do tap the oil and, and natural gas, and then they save the money. They're basically running national health care for free off of money they've banked in their sovereign wealth fund uh, from, they figure, hey, this is a one-time deal, that oil and natural gas are not replenishable, but let's not blow all the money now on the current generation like Saudi Arabia does. Let's go do the opposite, save the money so future generations can benefit from it. I'm not picking on Saudi Arabia randomly, they, they just have done a poor job saving the money. They, they have a government that runs big budget deficits even as they sell a bunch of oil uh, around the globe. Venezuela pumps oil as fast as they can. They're in a debt crisis right now. So Norway would be an example of some country that would use natural resources, but is hugely fiscally responsible with them. Well, 
Yeah, I, I think one of the, there's, there's certainly a, a different authors that have taken different takes on what was it that made Great Britain historically so exceptional and that caused them to spawn so many other countries in their image uh, that turned out to be pretty good uh, as well. And there are different ones. They point to the British rule of law as being uh, significant as opposed to French or Spanish civil law. And for those of you who don't know much about the legal system difference, civil law is based on you sitting around thinking about, well, what is right? and what is wrong, and thinking of this from an idealistic sense, I don't know, there's something in me that likes that, like of course there are things that are all right and you should define laws this way. But the British sense of common law is, well, how do we decide this? Well, what did we do yesterday? Oh, well, we'll just do whatever we did yesterday. It seemed to work all right. It's a practical legal system. So it's built based on what worked last time. So it's maybe, you could argue the British are less idealistic in a legal sense, in terms of legal framework, but man, they chose one that works. Uh, and it was able to evolve uh, over time with, uh, based on precedent. Uh, others would, would, would point to, if we look back to, say, 1820, right? If you do look at per capita income in 1820, uh, Britain, UK is number two behind uh, uh, the Netherlands. And you say, well, these are the two first countries that went through the Industrial Revolution. And, you know, what's triggering this? Again, a number of authors uh, uh, pointing to a number of different things. Um, one of my favorite economic historians, uh, points to the fact that uh, there was a change in cultural attitude. Uh, unlike in France or Spain, which uh, demonized, quite frankly, wealth creation, uh, Catholic Church maybe frowned upon the creation of wealth and charging interest. Uh, that it wasn't something, it wasn't that God shone upon the Netherlands and uh, the United Kingdom and said, thou art Protestant, therefore thou shalt flourish type of thing. It was more that the cultural attitudes that came along with the Reformation caused people to say, well, you're not a bad person if you're a banker. You, you could probably still go to heaven if you try hard or something. Uh, you can sell insurance. You can be a shopkeeper. Right? So uh, contemporaries of the day thought over in Europe, on continental Europe, they look back like, that's just a nation of shopkeepers. That's just pretty little practical people just moving stuff around and living above their shop. And Great Britain's like, well, that, that's what works. And, and being practical in that way, I think, was an important part. Uh, in creating this uh, foundation going forward. And now, that's why I'd like to point out that there are pol very practical policies of being open to trade and investment and immigration, that they're practical. They can be idealistic, too, in the sense of free movement of people. In fact, The Economist magazine notes the free movement of people is even more powerful as an economic tool than uh, free movement of goods and services. But uh, this idea of freedom could be an idealistic thing, and you could advocate for uh, ease of entry between the movement of people and goods around the world on a freedom thing, but you can take the historic British attitude of, well, it's practical, it works. Netherlands and Great Britain were the two big world traders in 1820. It's not a coincidence that they're at the top one and two in per capita income. They span the, the globe with their ships, trading with all kinds of different people. And the more people you're willing to trade with, the richer you're gonna be, because you're gonna find more people who are different from you that are good at different things. Well, there are definitely various, varying levels uh, of sins here that we can talk about. And none of these countries are sin-free in, uh, in that way. I mean, we can think about slavery in the United States uh, being a huge black eye on, uh, on its uh, both personal history, social history, economic history. Uh, were they able to create some wealth uh, by having slavery? Absolutely. Was it an unjust institution? Absolutely. Um, if you're thinking New Zealand, I mean, again, there, there are going to be shades uh, of gray uh, here. I mean, New Zealand's going to have a different attitude toward native populations than Australia. Right? You think of these as two ends of the spectrum. Australia, Captain Cook sets the flag, calls it terra nullius. That's a, a legal term, meaning there's nobody here. So the crown owns everything. No aboriginal rights whatsoever. New Zealand, not quite the same. The Maori, uh, from day one, once they uh, recognize the... the Queen is sovereign, they've got property rights. We can argue that property rights are a little squishy, but they've got property rights. Uh, they get to be, they hold positions in elected parliament. If you go back to the slide showing the percentage of population that's indigenous, mm -hmm. it was what? Pretty low for New Zealand. Mm -hmm. Fourteen, eighteen percent, 
Mm-hmm. And the U.S. even lower. I mean, well, at some point it would be. Well, I guess you. I guess you'd say. Would you say at some point in time it would ever be a hundred percent? Because if you look at uh, where these people came from, they they weren't created in New Zealand, Australia. They moved there at some point themselves. Uh, they moved to Canada at some point. They're 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 all. At, they're, we're talking about successive waves of immigrants. And so now what we're thinking about is, should there be some set of immigrants who says no more immigrants should be allowed? And is the act of a new immigrant coming in then an act of genocide? And I would argue that someone moving in, right, it'd be consistent with my talk, a new wave of immigrants does not mean it's necessarily genocide. If you go around killing people, it is. Well, uh, you They also uh, didn't on purpose a lot. I mean, there, there are some times where, yes, uh, wars happen. There are times when uh, land claim. The US government has a very poor record, for the record, on respecting Native American uh, property rights. Uh, one, if you're looking for a particularly bad case, uh, US Supreme Court has found in favor of uh, South Dakota and Indian tribe that uh, they should have uh, the land uh, that has the uh, Mount Rushmore on it. It's supposed to be their land. The U.S. Supreme Court has actually ruled in Native Americans' favor, and the U.S. government still doesn't turn over the land. They're like, ah, we carved some faces in your holy mountain, so we're keeping it. Like, there are definitely egregious uh, events here. Uh, the question is not whether or not any of these countries has a spotless record, but, you'd have, but you could ask, is, does any country have a spotless record? And I would argue, I, I don't know of one that has a spotless record not killing in, uh, innocent people or going to war with other people. Uh, the Maori, are, uh, they've got a culture of cannibalism. They're eating uh, each other. That's not good either. So it's not inherently awesome just to be there. Uh, it kind of depends on, uh, on what you're doing while you're there. So I, I'd hesitate to say it's a cold, uh, all these are countries uh, based on genocide or the only reason they're good is because they took stuff from people. Man, that, can, that can be applied to most places on the planet. I can, I, can, I can apply it to, uh, you could even say that's what happened in Zimbabwe recently. Uh, you could apply it to Rwanda. I mean, there's, it's, uh, genocide's never fun no matter where it's practiced. If I could add something to that problem too. If you look at some of the poorest countries in the world, okay, you cited some of the richest taking property and mass uh, killing. If you look at some of the poorest countries in the world, North Korea, for example, if we look at China after 1949, if we look at Cambodia in 1975, if we look at Cuba uh, after the 1957 revolution there, uh, and if we just keep going, these are some of the largest takings of property the world ever knew or imagined, much less knew. And so I don't know what numbers we would put on the uh, genocide of, of uh, post Bolshevik Revolution Russia, but I'm going to guess that somewhere around 15 years ago, that's the internal toll. Uh, North Korea will never know. Cam uh, Cambodia, Khmer Rouge, it's in a small country, I think it's five million. Mm -hmm. So we can find these acts done in the wealthiest countries. We, and these are the ones I just mentioned are some of the poorest countries in the world today. Uh, China is still it's not a wealthy country on average. It's wealthy on the East Coast, but its average income is in fact roughly half of Mexico. So I consider, I look at China as a low income country. So I think, again, your point's well taken at the top end, but you've got to get it at the bottom too. And I think you've seen these things at both ends of the, of the spectrum. I might just add that, uh, as a general, when you're looking through the economic histories of these countries, war is always bad for their economy. This is, this is not something, you would not help an economy, generally speaking, by killing people. Um, War is expensive. War leads to build up a national debt in all, all, all these countries. It's not something uh, that, I mean, if you're trying to base a successful economy on something, it would not be based on, uh, based, typically basing on warfare uh, in world history. Which statistic? Oh, work-life balance. What? Where is it? Where, oh. the, 
Oh, they weren't listed by, I'm sorry. Yeah, that, that was just a list. It wasn't, uh, that was the, they didn't match up with those countries. All those countries, here, I'll go back to this slide. All those countries. Oh, one more, all right. So, in a sense, I was trying to cram too much on one slide. This, uh, these are the variables, and I don't, if I, if I ax, maxed out one variable uh, and lowered all the other ones, I don't know off the top of my head which country ranks the most in any given variable. Uh, um, I would guarantee you Australia does well on the work-life balance and US does not. Uh, we work, but, it, but it's, uh, but it's, uh, it is basically this idea of, yes, your income might be high, so your, your income one and jobs numbers are big. But if you, in a sense, work too many hours a year, if your hours worked are high, they ding you because uh, you don't take enough time off. Um, but it, if you're interested in that one, it'd be interesting. You can go to this, uh, the, just type it Google or whatever search engine, uh, OECD, How's Life Index. It's fun to go pick out your variable that you like and max it out. I'm like, oh, well, that's, that's clearly the country. Uh, yeah, Oh, that's, that's a good question. Um, the, they, they keep the old ones up. Uh, and so 2017 is actually up now. And so we can even see in the last year how that's, uh, how that's changed. So you can go to the 2016 one, 2017. Off the top of my head, I, I haven't looked at Great Britain to see how the, that one variable has changed. But it is knowable. That's a great thing about it. You can go home and, and find out. Or if you stay afterwards, I can pull it up and we find out. Yes. Um, for a while, we were getting rid of uh, less desirables, creating penal colonies. Yeah, one man's less desirable is another man's uh, well, solid, you, solid uh, citizen. What I was going to say was, in retrospect, was that such a great policy? Uh, was it a great policy to get rid of the undesirables? Well, it depends what you're trying to achieve. If you're trying to set up an awesome country around the world that's hugely responsible and wealthy and has a great work-life balance, it was a great idea. They turned out well for them, for them. So their ancestors did well by that. And if they're going to be poor and oppressed in Great Britain, you're doing them a favor in that sense. Before you were sending them to uh, Australia, you were sending them to Georgia. Uh, my wife's from Georgia. So I must assume that everyone from Georgia history must also have been an asset uh, to the United States, not just economically, but personally uh, as well. So we, we fared well from it. We, we, didn't, we don't think of Georgians as being inferior for being... Uh, a prison stock. I mean, outside of myself, I kid, about, kid to my kids about it. Um, that being said, the interesting uh, take on that question is in, they, uh, after they shut down, well, we shut down them sending more to Georgia, so we, maybe we should have let them keep sending them. They sent them to Australia, but the first thought was to send them to South Africa. And when I was in South Africa, it was one of the, one of the guys we were talking to once, it was so enthralled. They, this is one of the best things that South Africa ever did. They, they, they stood up and they, against the British Empire and prevented prisoners from being uh, transported to, to South Africa. And I thought to myself, you idiot. Like, you, you robbed yourself of all kinds of people with lots of human capital who are hard workers, who would have made your economy uh, so much better off. And the joke's on you is that uh, the UK criminals are some of the best, best stock out there. <laughs> It, well, and that's the thing is most of these, the most of these convicts were, were, they weren't big criminals. They were petty, petty stuff. Um, and so you're not, you're not really dredging society to get rid of people either. You're really taking people that are very similar uh, to the people that already exist. Um, uh, I'm a little surprised in, in, in a sense that uh, maybe, maybe countries have stopped doing this because they realize how valuable maybe these, uh, uh, some of these people uh, could be, I guess, later on. And just, just a very final little sort of input as well. I wonder whether you agree that, uh, I mean, we've said already wars are not good for countries generally. Um, since uh, William the Conqueror, we've never been invaded. This country's always kept its independence. And, and it's always, like the Netherlands, has taken in people 
and integrated people. I mean, that has been part of the strength of uh, this country for, for many, many centuries. I mean, long before the USA, um, this was already happening. Mm -hmm. um, look at Elizabeth I and, and the way that she actually uh, managed to dominate through the Navy. And is that actually one of the key elements to the success of, of, of the sort of satellites that, that, that grew up in this country? Uh, absolutely. It's this idea of being open. People sometimes can even be a proxy for different ideas and uh, different skills. And so being open to having people come to your country, meaning you're, I mean, think about if you're closed-minded to science and scientific innovation, like, that's just not going to be helpful long term. So this idea of being open to others coming to you, this a sense of adventure going there and being, hey, it's, it's all one world. Uh, th those are going to play in tandem and both are uh, important. It's the going out and coming in uh, that's important. For an, econo for an economy, for a healthy society, uh, you get pretty stagnant if you're only the same people uh, all the time with the same ideas. You just don't, you don't get the, if you're thinking of a set of neurons, you don't get as many ne different combinations of neurons firing between uh, things. And it's, uh, if you know any, uh, the brain science seems to indicate that you need to fire as many different neuron connections in as many different directions as possible. It's kind of the idea behind liberal arts education in general, is you need to make different connections and that's what's gonna be important. So from an economy perspective, making as many different connections as possible in broadly different places is certainly going to be helpful. Not everywhere on the globe is going to be equally economically booming at any, any given point in time. Go ahead. An immediate hard Brexit is going to be going to be tough uh, for the economy, no question. The question isn't so much what happens immediately as to how does that uh, happen long term. And if it stays that they don't make uh, trade and uh, immigration deals with other countries around the world, it isn't going to look pretty. But there's so much potential uh, out there with, again, 7 billion other people in the world, those an endless set of opportunities exist. And heck, even within Europe, you've got the Swiss and um, uh, Norwegian models of all right, once Europe gets over itself and says, all right, we don't hate Great Britain even though they want it out of our club, it's in their economic best interest to trade uh, and have uh, trade deals with the United Kingdom. I mean, the United Kingdom's got a trade deficit with uh, the rest of Europe. It's not really in Germany's best interest to stop selling cars uh, over here. So I, I, I'm optimistic, uh, well, hopefully long term. But it's not that the political system couldn't go awry. Um, New Zealand, you saw, had huge numbers of immigrants that they were welcoming, and that's an all great story. They just had an election for a new prime minister there, and unfortunately, it was actually the Labor Party that went with the, the nationalists down there and are putting huge caps on immigration and foreigners' ability to own assets. It's crazy. I, I wouldn't have expected it from the Kiwis, and I'm quite frankly a little disappointed. Yeah, probably this is a broad and lower question, but uh, do you think that is it possible uh, that when they uh, successfully divorced with the uh, European Union, they want to join to, I mean, with uh, Well, I, I would think they, they would certainly at least think about this. They, they've, got, they've got so many different uh, um, uh, wheels going at the same time. They, certainly they would like to have access to the North American continent, but, you, but unfortunately this very second, you've got a president of the United States who wants to renegotiate NAFTA itself, and I don't think it's in the way of lowering trade barriers. So it's coming in an unfortunate time. Uh, Great Britain might be served a little better if the U.S. was standing up and saying, uh, we are a beacon of trade opportunities. We want to have low trade barriers with you. Uh, all of, we'd like to bring you into all of North America and have low trade barriers. We're, we're maybe lacking that leadership uh, in North America uh, right now. I, I, I don't know if you noticed, uh, uh, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton was in Great Britain a couple weeks, a month ago maybe now. And uh, I was a little disappointed. She, she was <laughs> warning Great Britain against making trade deals with the United States. I thought I didn't like that. Uh, I, we got enough hard time to start with, with uh, what I see as an anti-trade president. And so to try to gum it up even more, uh, I wasn't, I, I don't know, I didn't really particularly care for that. But, so no, I'm not optimistic short term, even 
Great Britain having access to North America, which is why thinking globally is probably uh, going to be its best bet short term. Thank you for the wonderful questions. Have a, oh, do you have one more? Right. Sorry, I don't see that. All right, go ahead. It's an economically similar uh, option. Because if we go back to the size of economies, it's not just that there's an equal number of people. Uh, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and per capita income are some of the richest uh, in the world. So you're talking about some of the bigger economies. So economically speaking, uh, I would similar size. It, well, yeah, so similar size. I, I might venture to say it's a higher per capita income. So I'm not. The big story, though, is just saying that while there is this potential opportunity out there, that even that's missing the picture. To think that you're just going to trade out English-speaking countries for Europe is still thinking too small. And I think it's historically problematic. What you really want are setting trade deals and movement of people as diversely as you can uh, across the globe. And the, the more, the bigger your circle of friends, uh, the more wealthy and prosperous and all these other quality of life metrics, uh, the better metrics uh, you're going to end up uh, with. Thanks. Have a good night.